Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, so I'm a teacher, so I know how this works, so I need everyone to stand up, inshallah. Everyone, please stand up. Everyone. Okay, the lights are pretty heavy. From what I can tell, we have brothers and sisters on separate sides. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to give a massage, a back massage to the person on your right. Go ahead. Enjoy. Just to wake you guys up. Okay. Some of you don't like back massages apparently. You can sit back down now inshallah. I'll have to think of something else for my second lecture. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يرشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها كذب الثمود بتغواها إذ بعث أشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله ناقة الله وسطياها فكذبوه فعقروها فدمدم عليهم ربهم بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف عقباها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عضوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear brothers and sisters, I started off with a recitation of Surah Al-Shams. The reason being is that this surah is very special in many ways and I can't go through a full translation of it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by many things. He swears by the sun, He swears by the moon, He swears by the stars, He swears by the, by the ground, the earth, the heavens, the skies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by many things. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the nafs, the self. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And Allah azza wa jal says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired the self with its sense of good and its sense of evil, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, all to come to one point. And I want you to think about this. Al Imam ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah in his book on Al Aqsam, on oaths, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by many things in the Quran. And Imam ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears, it's to emphasize the importance of what's coming next. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never taken more oaths in any other surah in the Quran as he has in this short surah. All to come to one point. Verily, he has succeeded who has purified his self and he has failed who has corrupted it and, and dirtied his soul. Corrupted the pure soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him. And this is very beautiful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us the power of the individual that nothing at the end of the day is more important than, than correcting and perfecting yourself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you might be wondering how does this relate to the Sahaba and following the stars of Islam? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of a sudden in the surah transitions to who? كَذَّبَ الثَّمُودُ بِتَقْوَاهَا إِذِنْ بَعْثَ أَشْقَاهَا Verily Thamud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about their failure, their arrogance, the way that they rejected their prophet, the way that they rejected a simple command not to kill the she-camel. But as a group of people, 
They all suffered from the disease of pride, meaning what? They failed to purify themselves. And because they failed to purify themselves as a society, they, be they became a transgressing nation, a corrupt people. And at the end of the day, all they earned was the destruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. Some of the Mufassireen, they pointed out here, notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not talk about an individual who transgressed. You know, Allah Azza wa was swearing by the importance of the individual purifying his soul. Or else, verily he would fail and he would become a loser. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not then give us the example of Fir'aun. Or he didn't give us the example of Haman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give us the example of Qarun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the example of a group of people. Why? Because when individuals fail to purify themselves, they become a transgressing society and their end result is misery and failure in every sense of the word. They would not achieve success in this dunya nor the akhirah. They all lose. When we look at the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first thing we need to understand about them is that they all had their own journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very unique way. They all had their circumstances. SubhanAllah, you find some of them were rich, were tested with money. Some of them were tested with poverty. Some of them were tested with a high social status before Islam. And some of them were tested with being slaves. Some of them were tested with frequent exposure to the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some of them never even met the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. They all had an extremely unique journey to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's something that's beautiful for us. Because when we look at the examples of the companions, we can find our story obviously magnified in some way, shape or form in one of them. You might read about the companions and you might have a particular affinity to one of them. You might be able to relate particularly to one of them because his story or her story reminds you of your story. If there's someone who is suffering, for example, with parents who are hindering them from, from pursuing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find sahaba that were tied up you will find Sahaba that were tortured by their parents. You will find Sahaba that had... Oh wow. As loud as I was speaking, you guys can hear me? You will find Sahaba who were rejected by their spouses. You will find Sahaba that were rejected by their children. You will find something in everyone. And subhanAllah, this is, this is Allah's gift to us. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emboldened the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions in their hardest times with the stories of the Prophets that came before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emboldens us with the stories of the Prophets and the stories of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as salaf al-salih, the pious predecessors that followed afterwards. Allah azza wa ta'ala gives us strength through that. We look to them and we understand we can achieve success as individuals. That, that truly, you know, we have no ceiling. We only place those ceilings on ourselves. The sky is our only limit. And subhanAllah, yesterday we were talking about, you know, uh, all of the mashayikh were talking about the importance of intention and things of that sort. And I'm going to put this down because I'm going to spill it. And we were talking about the intentions that, that we have to have in the sincerity. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he was asked a beautiful question. He was asked, what is the distance between us and the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he said, a sincere dua from a pure heart. That's it. <laughs> a sincere dua from a pure heart. And that's something really to think about that we all really need to think deeply about. When we look at the companions, they show us potential. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he also said, you can't make excuses for your circumstances anymore. He has a very beautiful page in his uh, beautiful book, Al-Fawa'id, Useful Sayings, where he draws many analogies, where he talks about the different journeys that people had. And he said, look, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a noble man, drowned in seas of evil, while Salman al-Farisi, whose father was the head of the Zoroastrian Majusi faith, was safe on the coast, came from Persia, traveled the entire world to find Rasulullah and find guidance. Whereas Abu Talib died in disbelief despite his nephew being the Prophet Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, a'azzul Arab, who was supposedly the most noble of the Arabs, preceded all of the Arabs in misguidance and being led astray. 
Whereas Suhaib al-Rumi, Suhaib the Roman slave, preceded all of the Arabs and the non-Arabs in guidance, in al-Hidayah. Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu used to say about Suhaib al-Rumi, this man that came in the caravan of the Romans. He, you know, he doesn't, he's not going to appreciate the beauty of the Qur'an the way that the Arab will appreciate it and the way that the poets will understand it. But Suhaib comes in the caravan of the Romans. And Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, this man loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much, لَوْ لَا يَخَافُ اللَّهِ لَمْ يَعْصِهِ Even if he didn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he still wouldn't disobey him. Developed a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was unparalleled. And he said, Abu Jahl, Abu al-Hakam, his name was the father of wisdom, became deaf to the call of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, even though before Islam, he was known as a wise, noble man. But whenever he heard the call of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, he fell deaf. Summum bukmun umyun fahum la ya'qilun. They're deaf, dumb and blind. They don't think, they don't come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of a self-imposed deafness. A self-imposed deafness. Whereas Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the slave who never even met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he became Muslim, was calling, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Subhanallah. And an Najashi was calling all the way from Abyssinia, despite being the head of his Christian faith, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ Here I am, here I am, O oh Allah. I'm answering your call, O oh Allah. Subhanallah, think about that. Basically what Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is showing us is that it's not about your circumstances, it's about you. The companions proved that to us more than anything else. They proved that to us. And he said, look at Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. You know, we we're talking about powerful speeches and how it's all about your heart and your disposition. Can you imagine Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul for nine years prayed behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wasn't listening to the qira'ah of, of Shaykh, you know, uh, Shaykh Mishari Rashd al-Afasi. He was listening to the qira'ah of none other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who when he used to read, his chest would boil like a pot. Subhanallah, like, like a teapot would boil. The Prophet would, would, you know, would boil because of how much tears he shed whenever he read the Qur'an. And who would recite more beautifully than the Prophet He was listening to his qira'a for nine years praying behind him. He wasn't listening to a khutbah by Mufti Mink or by Shaykh Abdullah Hakim Quick or our other mashayikh. He was listening to the khutbahs of the Prophet He wasn't just witnessing the character of, you know, of good Muslims around him. He was witnessing the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are on an exalted standard of character. Yet he still died in disbelief. The hypocrisy of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sarul was a hypocrisy of kufr, of disbelief. Despite those nine years. Whereas Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, look at Al-Qis ibn Sa'da. He never even met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but he still believed in him. You see the difference here, dear brothers and sisters? These companions show us that no matter what our circumstances are, we have no room to fail. We have no excuse to fail. We have no reason to feel sorry for ourselves and say, I'm not capable. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put that person, you know, he, mashallah, he understands Arabic, that's why. <laughs> that's why he's able to do so good. No, 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 no. Can't make that excuse. In fact, subhanAllah, I'll share with you a story of someone that's, that we would not consider from the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nevertheless, he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he still died on belief. I'm gonna say that again. Someone who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was alive, but he never became a Muslim, but he still died upon belief. Some of you are wondering, okay, this is strange. This is going to be an aqidah issue here. No. The Prophet ﷺ was once asked by Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sa'id ibn Zayd is from Al-Ashar al-Mubashireen, the 10 promised paradise. 
said, Ya Rasulullah, you know my father, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. You know him, and he's dead. Is he really going to be in the hellfire? You know, what, what happens to him? And who is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl? He's a man who the Prophet ﷺ knew before the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. And Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, even whenever shirk was widespread, before the Prophet ﷺ even made the call to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, he was from the few individuals who said there is no way that all of these idols are our gods. It just doesn't make sense. Not only that, but he used to speak out against the idols. And he was the nephew of Al-Khattab, the father of Umar ibn Al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was his nephew. And he knew that there is no way that these idols were gods. And you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reflected. He said, you know what? I remember one time I was sitting in a gathering with Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And they were serving meat and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never ate meat that was slaughtered in the name of the idols. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed. And then it came to Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And he started to speak at them and he, used, and he started to say to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you these animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for you from the skies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for you all of these means. And then you slaughter in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Speaking out against their practices. Used to go to the Kaaba. Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha. She says that he used to put his back to the Kaaba. And he used to say, no one of you is upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam except for me. What you are doing is not the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. I don't know what it is, but it's not this. And he used to make a dua. Asma radiallahu anhu heard his dua. And Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu. He also narrates this from his father. He used to make a dua. And he used to say, Allahumma law anni a'lamu ayyul wujuhi ahabbu ilayk. Oh Allah, if only I knew which path was most pleasing to you, I would worship you according to that path. But I don't know Allah. I don't know what it is. And he made sujood and he cried and he said, Look at that sincerity. Oh Allah, just guide me to that which is pleasing to you. And eventually he is oppressed and beaten by his uncle so much that he's, he leaves the haram and he goes looking for guidance around the world like some of his companions did, just a few people did. Looking to Christianity, looking to Judaism, trying to find guidance, trying to find Tawheed. He's not finding it. And you know what else he used to do? When Allah Azawajal says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيْهِ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And when the young girl that was buried alive, the disgusting practice of the Arabs when they used to bury their daughters alive, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the very early revelations, whenever that young girl speaks and says, for what reason was I killed? Why was I murdered? Before that ayah was even revealed, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr used to go to the places where the, the ditches on the outskirts of Mecca where they would bury their daughters and say, don't do that. Give her to me. I'll take her. And would raise these girls until they would reach the age of marriage and then marry them off. Subhanallah, no ayah, no Qur'an, no nothing. No, he didn't meet the Prophet ﷺ after he received wahi. And as he's traveling the world, and he finally hears that the Messenger ﷺ has come out from the place that he left, on his way back to Mecca, he dies. So he never got to see the Prophet ﷺ and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Can you imagine that? Subhanallah, this man's lifelong journey, you might think to yourself, wow, that's a tragic ending, right? Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, we know what he went through, traveling the entire world, all of those years, and how he must have felt when he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zayd never got to have that moment, but his son was the, one of the first to become Muslim. So his son is saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, you know my dad. You know, what is his situation? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have seen on the day of judgment that the nations will stand behind their prophets. Each nation will stand behind the prophet that was sent to them. And how many prophets were there? Someone other than the Mashayikh? How many prophets were there sent to mankind? Anyone know? 
124,000 prophets, anbiya, amongst them 315 rusul, messengers, in the authentic hadith in Ahmed by Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Out of 124,000 prophets, each of them will be standing on the day of judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said some of them will have large nations behind them and particularly Musa alayhi salam. Rasulullah when he sees the nation of Musa alayhi salam, he would think it's his nation. Then he would see his ummah come forward and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. His ummah come forward and they would dwarf the nation of Musa alayhi salam. And the Prophet ﷺ said some prophets though will stand with very few followers. Some with seven, some with ten, some with two, some with one. Can you imagine a prophet who spent his entire life in da'wah and has one person? And Rasulullah said, some prophets will stand with no one behind them. And you know what the Prophet said? And I have seen your father, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, standing as a nation on his own. Subhanallah. He's going to be all by himself on the day of judgment as a nation, as an ummah of his own. You know why? It was here. It was already here. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us of the Quran and the Sunnah is that which agrees with our fitrah already. That which agrees with our natural behavior already, what is already inside of us. The problem is, is that sometimes we don't choose to honor that fitrah. And subhanAllah, we look at the companions. And they were truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the main thing about them. The test of Bilal radiallahu anhu. You imagine what Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu went through when he was tortured in the desert. And I want you to think about this. Sometimes we really do not understand this. I mean, I know in, in, in America we have Fox News. Okay, that's the primary Islamophobic network. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu became Muslim because of Islamophobia. Think about it. If someone walked into your masjid and said, I want to become Muslim today, and you say, why? Well, I was watching Fox News and I was listening to Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly and these guys, Sean Hannity, and I decided that this is the truth. Like, what? Are you okay? You want to sit down for a minute and let's talk about this? Are you, are you mocking us? Bilal radiallahu anhu decided to become Muslim because he heard his masters speaking about the Prophet sallallahu in a derogatory way but gathered from what was said, Ahadun Ahad, that there is only one God. That was enough for Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be dragged into the desert, dehydrated, lashed, as if his circumstances were not already miserable, almost killed, have a stone placed on top of him, and forced almost to the brink of death, only saying, Ahadun Ahad, one, one. And Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu later on, and he used to call Bilal radiallahu anhu, our master who was freed by our master. Bilal is our master freed by our master, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he's sitting with Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, another slave who was tortured before Islam, who used to have his master pour burning hot coals on, on his back, burn the skin off of his back completely to the point that when Khabbab showed his back to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Omar saw this skinless back and said, what is this? What happened to you? And he told him about how his master used to take the skin off of his back, burning coal on his back, until the Prophet ﷺ made dua against her and his master took the coal and burned herself. Now Bilal radiallahu anhu, what's your story? Bilal, why is it that when you were being tortured, the only thing you were saying was ahadun ahad, one, one? Why didn't you say, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Allah majurni fi musibati wa khlufni khayra min? Why didn't you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his other names? Why didn't you say anything other than one? And Bilal radiallahu anhu says to Umar al Khattab, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, if I knew anything other than one, I would have said it. I didn't know anything else about Allah. I knew nothing else about Allah. But look what he was willing to go through. The test of Bilal, Bilal and Khabbab, they put their lives on the line. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu is tied to the story. Why? Because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes on the early days and he is as-Siddiq. He's the truthful person. And when Rasulullah sallallahu tells him, Ya Abu Bakr, I'm a messenger. Abu Bakr says, are you sure? 
He doesn't say to him, are you sure? Can you, can you split the moon for me? Can you, you know, make my camel flip over, do some jumping jacks or something like that? He doesn't say anything like that to the Messenger Wasallam. He says, I believe you. Not only did he say, I believe you, now let's get back to what we were doing as friends. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu goes back, goes out, and in one week brings nine of the greatest converts ever to Islam. Five of them from the Ten Promised Paradise. Goes and does da'wah. He spends with his money. He goes to these slaves that are being oppressed saying, La ilaha illallah, and he gives his money freely so that they can come out of that. Look at these companions. Bilal and Khabbab are putting their lives on the line. Abu Bakr is putting his money on the line. And Allah says, Jahidu bi amwalikum wa anfusikum. Strive with your wealth and with yourselves. And through each other, they are gaining leverage in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine that? Bilal and Khabbab are from the good deeds of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The point is, is that you could not say that they were not truthful in their belief. They were truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they all had their separate journey. And you know what, dear brothers and sisters, what's special about the companions? You know, we always talk about halal and haram. Shaykh, is this haram? And you know, a lot of times when people say, Shaykh, is this haram? I'm like, if I tell you it's haram, are you going to stop doing it? No? Well, don't ask. You're not interested in knowing. It's called fatwa shopping, right? In our day and age, it's how can I always do less? We, we, you know, we take baths in the doubtful matters, you know, as shubuhat. We will stay in that gray area proudly, you know, and just say, hey, I heard a sheikh say it's halal. I don't know who that sheikh was, but he said it's halal. You know, I found him online and he lives in some island in Trinidad. <laughs> no, I've never heard that one before. But he lives somewhere else and, and he, you know, I, I've never heard of him. I don't know, what's his name? I think his name is Abdullah Ibn something. Okay, you've narrowed it down to about 300,000 other people, sheikhs. Who is he? Where does he study? I don't know, but he said it's halal. Just deal with it. It's halal, it's halal, it's halal. I want to make it easy. I want, and you know what? Yassiru wa la tu'asiru. The Prophet said, make things easy, not difficult. Bashiru wa la tunafiru. Give glad tidings. Don't make people despair. That doesn't mean you change the deen. That means you deliver the deen in a way that people can digest it at a gradual place, but you don't lower the standard because you can't meet it. It gives you hope as to how you can reach that standard. That's what the Prophet ﷺ gave us. He didn't want us to be those people that are always like, you know, is it really, are you sure it's haram? Is it makruh? You know, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only hate it? Is it just sunnah? Can you imagine Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman coming to the Prophet ﷺ and saying, hey, is that just sunnah? Or is this fard on us? Is this really haram or is it just okay? You know, it's, it's makruh. Can you imagine the Sahaba saying that to the Prophet ﷺ? No, because they had a different, they had a different goal. Their goal was not just to get by as Muslims. Their goal was to always be the best that they could be. And so they always wanted to do more and more and more and more. And so the Prophet ﷺ didn't have to tell them, that, you know, hey, that's haram and I told you, why are you still doing that? The Prophet ﷺ had to tell them, calm down. You're going too fast. You're going to burn out. Can you, and I want you to imagine this. How many of you have kids in here? Raise your hands. SubhanAllah, in Trinidad, you guys really do have a crisis. None of you have kids. You know, what's going to happen in 20 years? How many of you have kids? Raise your hands. Oh, mashallah, what happened in the last minute? <laughs> Barakah, right? The story of Maryam or something like that, what happened? Everyone all of a sudden has kids. How many of you are not satisfied with the level of Islam of your kids? Raise your hands. Many of us. I'll raise my hand. I have a three-year-old. You know, I'm not too satisfied either. Okay? Now, anyone who has kids... Wow. In Trinidad, you don't have people that are as tall as me, apparently. Anyone who has kids is going to, you know, be a little concerned. And SubhanAllah, even as parents sometimes, we forget where we were as children. You want me to just hold it? No, no, wait. Let's carry it back a bit more. It's six, inch, six inches away from the mic. Can we play an ad as a break right now? Okay. 
anyone who has children will not be completely satisfied, right? You come and, and a lot of times, I, I know as, as an imam, and you can ask any of the imams, you have parents that come with their kids and say, Shaykh, my son is terrible. He doesn't care. He's lazy, right? He's doing this. He's doing that. Can you correct him? Can you give him the Holy Spirit? Can you touch him on the head? You know, and, and all of a sudden, inshallah, he's going to become religious. Can you give him a pill? You know, what can, you, what can we do? You know, it's like you want me to correct 20 years of bad parenting sometimes. I'm, not, I'm being honest. Sometimes it's really just bad parenting. And you want me to correct it with a, you know, just a touch. Shaykh, make it better, make it better, make it better, make it better. But even, you know, people, subhanAllah, who have high standards for their kids, a lot of times they're not going to be completely satisfied. Can you imagine Amr ibn al-As anhu complains to the Prophet about his son Abdullah ibn Amr. You know what his complaint is? My son prays too much at night. He fasts every single day and he reads too much Quran. How many of you would love to be able to complain about your kids that way? Raise your hand. My son reads too much Quran, prays too much and fasts too much. Ya Rasulullah, deal with them, right? Make them better. <laughs> Rasulullah has to take Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As and say, how much Qur'an do you read? You know how much Qur'an he was reading? He was finishing the entire Qur'an every single day. He was finishing a khitmah every single day. And the Prophet tells him to finish it in one week. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. The Prophet said, fine, three days. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. He says, no, just do three days. Now, weren't there people from the Sahaba that we know used to read the Qur'an more than once within three days? Yes, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't want him to burn out. He knew his level, he knew his capability. He knew he was going too fast. Read it once every three days. So dear brothers and sisters, those of you who, are, who read the Qur'an once every day, just read 10 juz a day from now on. Okay? Just 10 juz. So Rasulullah ﷺ tells him just 10 juz a day. How much do you fast? I fast every single day. The Prophet ﷺ told him to fast the three days, the three middle days of every month, the 13, 14, 15. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. The Prophet ﷺ said, fine, fast Mondays and Thursdays. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. The Prophet ﷺ says, then the best fasting is the fasting of Dawood salam, where he would fast one day and he would break his fast the next day. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. No, that's enough. So those of you that fast every day, mashallah, the righteous people of Trinidad, you can start breaking your fast one day and fasting the other day. How much do you pray at night? He would pray the entire night. The Prophet ﷺ told him, the best qiyam, the best prayer at night is the one who sleeps the first two thirds of the night, wakes up, or the first half of the night, wakes up for the last third of the night and sleeps the last sixth of the night. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more, that's enough. Just do that much qiyam. And Rasulullah gave him some advice, by the way. He told him, don't be like a person. When he gets old, it would be said, He used to pray qiyam al-layl, but then he stopped, meaning he burned out. You're doing too much. That's how the Sahaba were. Now we know the story of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he when when Umar bin Khattab used to you know said that I want to challenge Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and that's the beauty of the sahaba they didn't look to others and say oh that's okay he's a sheikh they were inspired by one another they envied one another in a good way they ulaika yusari'una fil khayrat they used to rush for the good deeds they used to compete with one another for good deeds. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu says, Look, I'm able to beat everyone else, but I can't beat Abu Bakr. And he said, One day I decided, today I'm going to beat Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So what did he do? He came to the Prophet وسلم, with half of everything that he owned. He said, Ya Rasulullah, here it is. For the sake of Allah and His Messenger. Wasallam. What did you leave for your family, O Umar? I left half of everything I own. MashaAllah, Ahsant, Ya Umar, you've done well, oh Umar, you've done good. All of us can look at Umar radiallahu anhu and say, that was a great move. Half of everything you own. Then comes Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Umar thought he won. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu didn't even know what Umar did. It's not like Abu Bakr said, oh yeah, fine, I'm going to give everything I own. Abu Bakr came organically and gave everything to the Prophet. 
Rasulullah sallallahu said, what have you left for your family? Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu gave it all, right? And subhanAllah, a lot of times we think, well, that means we should all give it all. You know that if you study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu he didn't allow any other sahabi to do that. No companion was allowed to do that except for Abu Bakr. Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu and the famous story of his tawbah, of his repentance, where he was so happy and he was one of the richest men in Medina. He was so happy when Allah accepted his repentance that Ka'ab radiallahu anhu gave everything. He even took off the thawb that he was wearing and gave it to the one that gave him the news that Allah accepted your repentance. And he comes to the Prophet sallallahu and says, I'm giving all of my wealth for the sake of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu says, Amsik alayk ba'd al-man. Hold on to some of your wealth. And Rasulullah is telling him, don't give it all. Ka'b radiallahu anhu is saying, fine, I'll keep some of what came from the spoils of Uhud. But everything else is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet didn't let him give it all. Likewise, Abu Talha, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, you will not achieve true righteousness or the reward of righteousness being Al-Jannah until you spend from that which you love. Abu Talha had the gardens of Bayruha, which today if you go to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ used to relax in that garden. People used to enjoy that garden right behind the masjid. They're actually right in front of the masjid. You know, they used to relax in that beautiful garden. It was his best garden. Palm trees, springs, everything. And Abu Talha heard that verse and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, he comes to him and he says, I thought of Hatta Tunfiqu Mima Tuhibun till you spend from that which you love. Ya Rasulullah, here is Bayruha for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm giving the entire garden away. And you know what the Prophet ﷺ says to him? Ara and tajalaha fil akrabin. I think you should save it for your family members, for your kin. And his intention was still solid. He had it inside of him. I want to give it all. But the Prophet ﷺ told him no. Why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu? Why was Abu Bakr allowed to give it all? Because the Prophet ﷺ knows Abu Bakr will come and give it all. And he's not going to go home and go, Oh my God, what have I done? And his wife is not going to say to him, What? You gave it all away? No, Abu Bakr will give it all. Then he'll go and he'll work in the market until he earns enough to give again. That was the attitude of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Kana sabbaqan li kulli khayr. As Ali radiallahu anhu says about him, that if you thought about good, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu already did it. When you have a good idea, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu already superseded all of the Sahaba in doing it. And so Umar radiallahu anhu says later on, when Abu Bakr is Khalifa, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, went to the outskirts of Medina, where there were some elder people that weren't being served, that couldn't be tended to. And so he goes and he does this secretly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first door he knocks on, on the outskirts of Medina, the old woman says, someone has already come. He says, who's already come here? Someone's already been here. And so Umar radiallahu anhu demands to know, and she's not giving away the identity. Umar radiallahu anhu goes and hides behind her house, waits to see who it is. And here comes the Khalifa, the first non-prophet Khalifa, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The first non-infallible non -infallible Khalifa, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. With everything on his plate, from people leaving Islam, people withholding their zakah, you know, people celebrating the death of the Prophet sallallahu coming out to these old elderly people on the sides to serve them. And Umar radiallahu anhu cries and he says, I have never, you know, and he used to say, Laqad at'abta man ja'a min ba'dik. You have exhausted everyone that comes after you, O Abu Bakr. And he said, By Allah, I've never taken a path of good except that I found Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu already traveled it. That's how they were. I want to do more. I want to do more. And so the poor Sahaba come to the Prophet sallallahu And they say, Ya Rasulullah, the rich companions have taken all of the ajr. Rasulullah sallallahu says, Why? They said, because they pray like we pray, they fast like we fast, you know, they do all the ibadat like we do, but they're able to give charity and we're not. And the Prophet ﷺ says, hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given you something to give sadaqah with, to give charity with? Every subhanallah is a charity. Everyone say subhanallah. Every alhamdulillah.
Just say subhanallah. Every alhamdulillah is a sadaqah. Say alhamdulillah. Every Allahu Akbar is a sadaqah. Say Allahu Akbar. Every la ilaha illallah is a sadaqah. Say la ilaha illallah. And so these companions were happy now. They got their way. Then they come back to the Prophet ﷺ complaining. You know what their complaint was? Ya Rasulullah, the rich Sahaba found out about what you gave to us and now they're doing that too. It's not fair. How come they get to give salaqah and now they get to do tasbih and tahleel like we do? And Rasulullah says, Dalika fadlullah. That is the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests whom He wills for it. And the victory is for the believers, for those who are pious. SubhanAllah, that is the, that is the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yu'tihi man yasha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to whom He wills. Wallahu dhul fadl al azim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the Almighty and bestower of bounties. That's a gift. Everything these people looked at, they thought to themselves, how can I use it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In fact, even when we look at the conquest of Persia, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the believers victory against Kisra, and Kisra had an amazing palace. And you know, this is the problem when you read a hadith and you don't know context. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you will open the White House. Al-Baytul Abyad. And some people now, they look at this hadith and see, see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, 1400 years ago, we're going to conquer the White House. <laughs> the White House that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about was the White House of Kisra, the Emperor of Persia, who had a huge white palace. And the Muslims, when they entered into the palace of Kisra, after suffering at the hands of the Persians, when they entered into the house of Kisra, the palace of Kisra, and they saw this wealth that they've never seen before in their lives, and they were excited and they were happy, they carried it and they were pleased, not because they were like, all right, now we're going to get to put all this stuff in the pockets. You know, they weren't going through Kisla's jewelry boxes and looking around, it's sad looking right now. They weren't doing any of that. They carried this wealth. They brought this back to the Khalifa, pleased that they were able to give this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They weren't even shaken by it. They weren't even affected by it. And so Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, when he prayed in the palace of Kisra, and then he recited the verses, كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونٍ وَزُرُوعٍ وَمَقَامٍ كَرِيمٍ وَنِعْمَةً كَانُوا فِيهَا فَاكِهِينَ كَذَارِكَ وَأَوْرَثْنَاهَا قَوْمًا آخَرِينَ فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْظَرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Fir'aun and his people. How many palaces, how many gardens, how many rivers did they leave behind? How much did they leave behind in this world? And just like that, we snatched it. And we allowed another group of people to take it. The heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them. And this is a very beautiful tafsir from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. I don't have time to go into it. Just read what Ibn Abbas says about this ayah. And I really don't have any time to go into it. In fact, I don't have time to finish my talk. But they did not leave behind any meaningful legacy. These palaces went to waste. Everything that Allah gave to them went to waste. And they were not from those who were granted respite in the Akhirah. Dear brothers and sisters, that's who the Sahaba were. They looked to everything and thought, what can I do with this to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, when someone comes and says, what is the most pleasing deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What can I do? Give me some advice to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the best thing to be doing? What is the best situation? And we look, the Prophet sallallahu gave different answers to different people. But the true answer is that if you really want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then make sure that you are where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be. When Allah wants you to be there, doing what Allah wants you to be doing. And bi ta'ala, if death finds us in that situation, then we will be from the fortunate. And Allah knows the situation that we are in right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not ignorant of our circumstances or unaware of our circumstances, nor is the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why in the authentic hadith of Abi Thalaba radiallahu anhu, because you know a lot of times we look to the Sahaba and we think of them like they're the Avengers or something like that. You know, Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu was the incredible Hulk. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was sliding. No, but this is what we look to them as. The Avengers. 
They're fictional characters. These were real people that face real circumstances. And the Prophet ﷺ also knew what our circumstances would be like. And he loved us for that. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to go to the graves and he said, Hum ikhwani, hum ahbabi, they are my brothers, they are my beloved. And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, who are they? Al Ansar or Al Muhajireen? And Rasulullah says, No, you are my companions. My brothers, my beloved ones are the ones who believed in me and they never even saw me. Allah knows how much it grieves us to not have been able to meet the Prophet ﷺ in this dunya and believe in him. And that the greatest tragedy we faced was his death. But you know what else? Abu Tha'lab narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna min wara'ikum ayyam as sabr, that verily behind you, O companions, are days that will require great patience. As sabr fihi, or to be patient in those days, mithlu qabdun ala al jamr, would be like grabbing a burning piece of coal. And for the one who applies his deen, and think about holding a hot piece of coal, and he's telling the companions that with all that they went through, and he's talking about those that come afterwards. And for the one who acts in those days, is the ajr, the reward of 50. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, hold on. Ajru khamsina minhum, 50 of them, the reward of 50 of them. The Prophet says, no, ajru khamsina minkum. The reward of 50 of you. When we do a good deed, it's multiplied. Why? Because Allah knows our circumstances. And I want to leave you for one story with one story, just to show you that people existed after the companions that held on to this. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Fi kulli qarnin min ummati sabiqun." In the authentic hadith in Abi Nuaym, the Prophet ﷺ said, "In every generation of my ummah, there are people that are at the, that are at the forefront." There are people that supersede others. There are people that do more good deeds than others and people that meet the threshold better than others. There, is always, there are always going to be people ahead of the bunch. Because a lot, you know, there's the saying that some people try to be outstanding, but they don't stand out. And they seek to be extraordinary, but they end up being extraordinary. People are satisfied with complacency. Al-Ghuraba are not. Al-Muhsineen are not. And I want to give you a story especially in light of what's taking place in Egypt right now. I want to give you a story about not a companion, about a great da'ya, a great scholar who passed away in the 1990s by the name of Sheikh Abdul Hamid Al-Kishk rahimahullah ta'ala, who stood against injustice in Egypt and stood against oppression and whose manbar used to shake with sincerity. Wallahi, if you go to the Middle East sometimes, you can hear cars, you know, the way that you would hear people blasting music, you can hear cars shaking with a khutbah from a Shaykh Kishk rahimahullah ta'ala. And this man, his dua was truly accepted. And we were talking about duas being mustajab. I remember listening to a clip from the 1970s when Al-Qaddafi from Libya said to uh, said, to, said to, the, to the rulers in Egypt, he asked for the grave of Jamal Abdel Nasser to be transferred to Libya and offered $500 million. And he said, so that people can come do tawaf, people, people can come visit him the way they visit the Prophet ﷺ. And when Sheikh Kishk heard that, he made dua against him on the manbar. And he said, O oh Qaddafi, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you a person who is taken out from al-magari, from the sewage system. I hope your people pull you from the sewage system and throw you away in an undisclosed location. Subhanallah. That's exactly what happened to the man. Allah answered his dua. But you know what else? He used to make other duas. And on December 5th, 1996, he had a special dream. On December 5th, he woke up on December 6th and he says to his family, and I'm going to end with this inshallah ta'ala because I don't want to be interrupted with anything. I want you to pay attention. On December 6th, which was Yawm al Jum'ah in 1996, as the family is getting together to eat breakfast, which is very common in the Middle East before Jum'ah, people come together, the extended family to eat breakfast together. He tells his wife to hold the food. And as his family sitting there, he says, I want to share with you a dream that I had last night because the Prophet ﷺ said that if you see something good, share it. And he said, I saw a dream last night that 
I was in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Umar bin Al-Khattab Radiallahu Anhu. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told me, Say Salamu Alaikum to Umar. Sallim ala Umar. They were happy to see me. And he said, Shake the hand of Umar bin Al-Khattab Radiallahu Anhu. And he said, So I shook the hand of Umar bin Al-Khattab Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu. Shortly after that, I fell dead in my dream. And he said, then the Prophet ﷺ came with Umar ibn Khattab. They carried my body and Rasulullah ﷺ did my ghusl. And I was watching that. What a dream. And his wife is in tears. And Shaykh Kishk, rahimahullah, when he woke up that morning, he asked his son. He said, how old was the Prophet ﷺ when he died? And he knows the answer. He said he was 63 years old. Sheikh Kishk said, Alhamdulillah, I turned 63 today. And his wife says, why are you sharing this dream with us? When the Prophet ﷺ said, when you see a bad dream, don't share it and it won't hurt you. And he says to her, who said this is a bad dream? He said, Wallahi, I wish that things would happen exactly as they happened in that dream. And so he goes and he makes his ghusl for Salat al-Jum'ah. And he goes out to lead the salah. And as he is praying, when he goes into his sujood, Allahu Akbar, he never comes back up. That's December 6, 1996. And you know what, dear brothers and sisters? It was witnessed by many people. And you know what, dear brothers and sisters? He used to ask for that in his khutbas. He used to say in his du'as, you can still hear at the end of his khutbas, Allahumma ahyini imama. Oh Allah, allow me to live as an imam and allow me to die as an imam. And allow me to be raised while I am making sujood to you, O Lord of the worlds. And Allah gave him everything he asked for. There are people like that that live amongst us. There are people like that that reach a level that is close and that will earn them the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions in Al Firdaus Al A'la. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Jannah Al Firdaus. Say Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ in paradise. Say Ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who do everything that has, that has been, who, who do everything with, with everything that has been given to them to please Him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to die being pleased with him and him pleased with us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from as-sabiqoon, al-awwaloon, al-muqarrabun, and to make us from al-muhsinoon. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumallahu khayran. Aqoolu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.